everyone, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfati, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Uh, our guest speakers today are Drs. Uh, Kari Ho, Chris Bollier, uh, Paulo Elito, and Gunnar Estrom. This session will focus on intervention, and the speakers will present their cases, and then at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have any questions at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box, and at the end, uh, the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases almost every day, consider registering on the OCAD website. The OCAD website is full of cases and videos of lectures and sessions. A quick reminder, Attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding. And with that, I will ask Hillary to kick off the session. Okay, I'm kicking off the session by introducing my very good friend, Gunnar Ostrom. He, is, uh, he was the Congress president of ESSR in 2020, a very good year if you remember, editor-in-chief emeritus of skeletal radiology, and he is currently a consultant radiologist of the oncology department at Uppsala University Hospital in Sweden. Most importantly, he's a very good longtime friend of mine and he um, he has a very important job because he has attended all three of the live OCAD meetings, and he is our uh, master of awards. Okay, master. Okay, Show thank you. So it's a seventy-year-old female, still going strong after twenty years' disease with a rectal carcinoid with metastasis. Case case that is handled with personalized care. It was a rectal carcinoid, surgery with a scope, very few mit mitosis, so it's slow growing. The year four, it was a tumor left of the rectum here, and a 5-HTP pet avidity in, no, scintigraphy in, no, it's a pet, in L1 and 2 liver, lesions. The liver lesions were surgically removed at the time of the rectal anterior resection. The lower lesion was also treated with RF under ultrasound guidance intraoperatively. She said, then also received intravenous lutetium 177, which is, a, which is a peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. And there you can see the spine lesion and the liver lesions and the uh, uh, rectal, uh, pararectal lesion. So the, the spine lesion went to radiotherapy and disappeared, the uptake disappeared after radiotherapy. I'm not sure that this is a cause of metastasis, could also be a hemangioma, but I think hem this kind of hem hemangioma, hem hemangioma should also be treated with uh, radiotherapy. And then the year 11, a metastasis of soft tissue with bone involvement occurred under the temporal bone. And it's also strange, it's a lot of periosteal reactions and it's slow growing, so why? This is a Dotatok uh, uh, pet and uh, What's happened now? We have to think. Is going to be surgery or proton therapy? And at the end, it went to proton therapy, and uh, with two fields. 
and it went to be a small shrinkage of the lesion. And then after three years, it started to grow again. The year 13, metastasis in the right acetabulum, which also got SPRT, and it took two years for it to go away as a, to be avid. So then, so why wasn't that just go away when the L1 just went away? That is a question. And then it was a new one here, and that was treated with radio free frequency treatment in Uppsala. And then year 14, it was meant to be progression of the metastasis at the skull base. Would it now be surgery or ablation? So I talked with people in Strasbourg, I talked with Karlström in Mayo Clinic, and uh, it wasn't too fantastic that they wanted to do things. And then suddenly it popped up uh, a, a nose surgeon in an Uppsala that can do it transmaxillary. And here's in, in the operation room with a scope like this. Here you, it's, uh, um, they can see in every plane on MR and they go transmaxillary, oops, transmaxillary like this. To the, and then it went also to do, do this and surgery. And then they cut here and they go transmaxillary there. That one is there also. And they had to cut the temporalis muscle. And then they do the ablation around the tumor with the coblation, which is another technique uh, compared to RF. It's a frequency, but it's a low temperature. And is a synaptocene staining, so it's a carcinoid tumor. And he can also see on these images how much periostal reactions there are, there, there are everywhere. It's very strange. And it's almost no key 167, just one to two percent. And the surgeon could go in and then it drilled hole like this and then it could knock off the bone, the periosteal re reactions. You can see a tumor like here, and it's normal marrow just adjacent to it. In year 17, it was a small remaining avid rest. This was removed by a fourth transmaxillary endoscopic surgery. And after that, we haven't seen any more uh, signs of avid lesions in that region. But the patient started to get new metastasis. The year 16, it was a right hip metastasis with cryotherapy and stabilization, and two lungs met with cryo one in one treatment session in Gustave Rossi Hospital in Paris. So there is a growing hip lesion. There is an RF treatment before, and it was uh, uh, ablation and stabilization with PMA, PMMA. The two lung meds, it was cryo first to the lower one here. You can see the rest of the, the cryo and the upper one there, and it's just a small rest there. Here's both of these lesions. And then the next year, 17, it was cryo left femur, lung, another lung lesion, sternum, and in one treatment session in Paris. So first this lesion in the femoral diaphysis with an approach from here, like there. So the patient is prone and then it's uh, the, this lesion, the pulmonary lesion, is just adjacent to the esophagus vein. So it is, first it's a probe near the metastasis, then a second probe placed after iatri and pneumothorax with carbon dioxide, and then a new replacement of the first probe. 
And he, that he is the result of that oblation. And the stern omission was cryo ablated by an axial approach, and you can see the result here. And in all these um, ablations, there is no recurrence. In, in year 18, it was time for a liver metastasis, metastasis with cryo or in L4 sacrum and left hip during one treatment session in Paris. So she has a lot of time in Paris. So the RF, the liver metastasis couldn't be seen uh, and they have to do a combined NU and CT. And, and it went to be a small pneumothorax because it went very low. So it was a chest tube for that one. And here's the result of the ablation. First, we asked in Uppsala if they wanted to do an RF ablation by, by means of a tractor through the liver. But then they didn't dare to do that because they were afraid to damage uh, the diaphragm. And then cryo to this lesion in L4. Here you can see, uh, and that was a cryoablation zone. And you can see the cryoablation zone there and here. It's very nice. It looks like normal bone, bone in between. So it's really fantastic. And then it was cryo in the sacrum here. And there is a result. You don't see anything, but it's no recurrence. And then the left hip. Once again, with cryoablation and stabilization. And then the year 19, it started to be progression with more bone mats and also small mat addition to the heart. There is the, the L1 lesion and there is a bladed L4 and the new ones in the thorax, thoracic spine. So what's happening then in year 19 to 20, due to the new bone mats and one possibly met at the right heart border, the new regime of lutetium-177 treatment was started late year 19 and the third one is just given. As you can see to the right, uh, with this scintigraphic image at time for the third treatment, the, the, the lesions was all lesions are almost gone as, as avid in the tetsum tracer. And there was no new detected metastasis. So what can we do with this? It's later PET than CT or MR examinations might point out lesions of interest for percutaneous ablation techniques or perhaps radiotherapy. This patient now has, has got lutetium-177 two times, and uh, one time might give, gives a high, uh, an increased risk to get leukemia, and two treatments will probably increase that risk. So that was my first case, and, and uh, it's, how MSK can come in and help in personalized medicine, combining with other treatments. Um, and then I also have a second case, if I can do that, it's three or four images. It's a 64 year, year old female with a renal carcinoma treated with a nephrectomy. Two new tum tumors in the remaining kidney treated with cryoablation a huge metastasis in right sacrum, heavily treated with or radiotherapy with a huge post radion bone necrosis of the ileum, right and central sacrum, and pre sacred soft tissue FTG uptake. Patient was treated with multiple cytotoxic drugs and immunotherapy, and there were small remaining areas of increased FTG uptake in sacrum. The pre sacral uptake was gone. However, patient couldn't get new drugs, immunotherapy without confirming biopsy that, that, this, that the 
avid part in the sacrum was a, metast a metastasis. So first here you have the avid part, and then it's a, a, a transiliac sacral biopsy here, and it was a metastasis. So then we have to think, can we do, do immunotherapy? So, so we thought about that, and then after one or two months, we decided to do this. And then we went through the ne necrotic part into the uh, avid part of the sacrum. And we have to be very careful because it was three nerves that could be damaged. So what, what, why, do, why to do this cryoablation? It was not aimed to take away all tumor. It was aimed to make uh, tumor necrosis, so we get free anti tumor antigens in the blood and in the tumor. And, and then those antigens uh, will present to the CD8 T cells, which then are going to around here in the tumor and also perhaps in other parts of the body making an upscopal effect as we were talking about in the Oak and Live meeting. And then one and a half months post the cryo, you can see a huge reaction in the lymph nodes in the mediastinum. It's a sarcoid reaction showing that here it's really a huge T cell cascade going on in this human, this woman. And however, the avidity in the sacrum is now more extent, more extensive, but that is most probably a flare effect. So hopefully with the next, next test in one or two or three months later, it will be much less. So that, this is also how we can come in into a personalized medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Great cases. Um, now it's my turn to introduce Dr. Paulo Elito. He's a musculoskeletal radiologist at Hospital Sirio Libanês and the current section head of MSK radiology at Hospital das Clinicas of the University of Sao Paulo. <coughs> he graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Sao Paulo a medical residency uh, in radiology and diagnostic imaging, a fellowship in MSK radiology and a doctorate degree in medical sciences at the uh, Instituto de Radiologia do Hospital das Clínicas at the same university. He has uh, co-authored book chapters and authored and co-authored several papers on MSK radiology, orthopedic imaging, and other, other areas, including imaging of the spine, neuromuscular disorders, and rheumatology. He's an active participant of uh, Sociedade Paulista de Radiologia, the Radiology Society of São Paulo, where he has coordinated the MSK group from 2017 to 19. And he's also a board certified radiology member of the Brazilian College of Radiology. Please, Paulo share your case with us. Thank you, Alini. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to show a case. It's, it's definitely not as complex as Dr. Gunner's case. And uh, it's just a, a, a really nice case of, a, of an elegant treatment of uh, a tumor. So let me begin. Uh, so the clinical case is a 50-year-old female. She, she has no known systemic diseases. She had a previous resection of a shivanoma in the tarsal tunnel of the right ankle. And now she, she presented with a long-standing foot pain and the same, same uh, foot, the right foot, uh, that was progressive, uh, uh, that had progressive worsening. And the pattern of the pain was very uh, suggestive of a, a nerve tumor. So it, it had a shock-like pain uh, with pins and needles sensations in the right foot. 
So to start with, she she went she went to an MRI, and this is the MRI. So I'll I'll show it briefly that there is a uh, a tumor here in the uh, just beneath the tarsal bones. Let me show again in the coronal plane. So there is a highly hydrated tumor uh, just uh, beneath the uh, medial uh, all the cuneiforms. And we can see the same tumor in the sagittal plane. So it's uh, just uh, very close to the bones and very deep uh, in the in the right foot. Here is a uh, neuro MRI sequence. Again, a very hydrated tumor just beneath the cuneiform bones, and with uh, a lot of enhancement. Uh, homogeneous enhancement. So since the uh, patient already had a, a previous shivanoma and uh, the pain was very typical, our first hypothesis was a nerve sheet tumor. But we, uh, we also included like uh, maybe some a sarcoma in the differential diagnosis. So we underwent uh, an imaging guided biopsy. The patient underwent an imaging guided biopsy and steroid injection. At the same moment, since uh, we have the imprint in the at the same moment, so there was already a high suspicion, and we could do like uh, analysis of the material just at the moment of the biopsy, highly suggestive of a uh, benign tumor, and so this is the as axis, uh, medial axis of the foot. And this is the biopsy. So the patient, uh, the result was as expected a shivanoma and she had a significant pain relief for four months. Uh, but in the follow-up, the, the patient uh, started to have pain again, repeated the injection with incomplete pain relief. And the, the pain was uh, progressive worsening. So she she started to have episodes of uh, shock like pain uh, at rest, not only when uh, walking while walking. So uh, the surgeon contacted me and and asked uh, if uh, if we could do anything imaging guided because the the access for surgery was uh, very difficult. So I proposed we we could do an imaging guided cryoablation of the shivanoma. And this is what we did. We did it under anesthesia with a 13 gauge uh, cryobation needle with a medial approach, just as I showed for the biopsy with a pretty standard cycle. Uh, and this is the, the access, so medial access, uh, cryobation directly in the lesion. We try to protect the skin with a uh, bag of warm uh, uh, physiologic serum. And this is the, the, the moment of the cryoablation. We can see clearly see the ice ball here. And the follow-up was the patient uh, had no complications. She had mild pain in the first days that, that subsided with oral and analgesics. And she's, it, it has been one month since the, the procedure. So she has been one month pain-free, no shock line pain, no pains and needle sensations. Since the procedure, she's very happy. Uh, we just did a uh, control MRI. So this is the, the control MRI, post-contrast sagittal image. We see no enhancement uh, inside the tumor. We see the peripheral uh, reaction to the cryoablation. And here you can see uh, the patient sent uh, during the, the days after the, the cryoablation. I, I believe this is uh, two to three weeks after the, the treatment. We can see just a small scar in the medial aspect of the foot. Uh, and she was imagining if she had a surgery that, that she will have like a, a, a larger scar and maybe uh, some uh, sequela in the soft tissues. And this is a subtraction, Im subtraction image. 
from both to uh, subtracting pre contrast, and we, we see no enhancement in the tumor. So, this is a, a, a pretty straightforward case that how we can treat a, a benign tumor, a schwannoma, that is a benign nerve tumor, uh, often sporadic. It's characterized by a slow growing circumscribed mass, which may, may have cystic degeneration and some other signs of uh, nerve sheet tumors like split fat sign or target sign. And we know that the treatment, when, it, when the tumor arises from a, a large nerve, the treatment is usually surgical enucleation, uh, preserving the nerve. But when it affects a small nerve, uh, the treatment is usually an, in block resection. And this is where uh, cryoablation is a, a very nice alternative because uh, it's, a, it's a benign lesion and, and we can completely ablate it. So especially in, the, in lesions difficult to reach as in our case, or maybe in patients who are not good candidates for surgery, uh, the cryoablation is a very nice alternative. Uh, we can do it with sedation and even with uh, local anesthesia. Uh, and the patient usually has a rapid discharge from the, from the hospital. And it's very nice to use cryoablation because we can see the, ablated, the ablation zone. We can see the ice ball. And as, we, as you all know, this is a very elegant uh, method. So I, I only found one, one uh, letter to the editor in, in the Interventional Imaging Journal, Diagnostic and Interventional Imaging, that regarded the, the percutaneous cryoablation of schwannomas. And uh, I, I found some other articles. So just to remember that, that for those benign tumors that are uh, usually resected in block, uh, we can use cryo as a very nice alternative. So this was my case. Uh, thank you, Alini, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo, for sharing this great case with us. Um, now I'm introduce Dr. Um, Chris Bolli. He's a professor of radiology, associate chair of education, and former chief of musculoskeletal imaging at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. He received his MD degree and a PhD degree in biological structure from the University of Washington in Seattle. And he was a resident and chief resident in radiology at Duke University in, in Durham and followed by a fellowship in body imaging at Stanford. Subsequently, he was a vis visiting fellow in MSK imaging at the University of California, San Diego. His research has focused on computer graphics, computer aided diagnosis, artificial intelligence, as well as numerous technical and clinical musculoskeletal imaging and interventional projects. He has a very popular YouTube channel with more than 36,000 subscribers, and that mm -hmm. highlights a variety of clinical topics in MSK. His most recent academic work involves development of an open source source teaching and learning software platform. It's called Stella, the Stanford Electronic Learning Library and Applications System, which went live at Stanford in 2023. And he is also a very good, good friend of mine. Please, Chris, share your case with us. Thank you so much, Eleni and, um, and Hillary for inviting me to speak today. Um, that was a way too long of an introduction that I sent you, um, but but thank you for that. Um, I'm I'm happy to to speak to everyone today about uh, my experience with muscle and tendon injuries, and I'm gonna have a little bit of a different format. I'm gonna show a number of cases across the spectrum of these types of injuries. Um, these are common problems, right? Muscle and tendon injuries, and most of of them are treated conservatively with rest, ice, compression, and medications, and then occasionally and maybe increasingly with surgery, um, an invasive uh, technique, obviously, um, especially for avulsions and things like that that are distracted. Um, what I want to focus on is the kind of intermediate zone of minimally invasive injuries 
that we can use um, image guidance techniques to treat. So draining of collections, injection of medications, PRP, things like that. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. I find it useful to uh, think about these injuries according to their, their location along the kind of myo myotendinous unit. And I, I, I use the semitendinosis as kind of a model here. There's nothing, nothing particularly important about the semitendinosis, but these, these uh, structures have an origin, they have a myotendinous uh, junction, and they have the muscle belly, and some special ones have two of, two of each of those. Um, so injuries at the origin or insertion of myotendinous units may include things like peritendinitis, tenosynovitis, if there's a tendon sheath, tendinopathy. You can also have high-grade injuries like avulsion, and on the right side, I've kind of enumerated some of the possible therapies that we can use for these, these injuries. So steroids, PRP, uh, drainage of collections, and so on. So, so let's look at some cases here. So here's an um, example of iliopsoas peritendinous inflammatory change. It may or may not be actually in the bursa per se, but edema around the, the iliopsoas tendon on axial and on sagittal. And that's a good target for percutaneous injection, um, assuming that correlates with the patient's pain. Um, traditionally, what I've done with this is a longitudinal approach. And so here's the femoral head, here's the iliopsoas tendon here, and a needle coming through the psoas muscle to abut the anterior surface of the tendon, and then injecting medication that's a combination of the uh, local anesthetic to spread out the steroid and the steroid medication itself, This, in this case, an intermediate acting steroid. Um, a different example of proximal injury, uh, peritendinitis and tendinopathy of the hamstring tendons in a running athlete, um, pretty advanced degree of tendon degeneration, partial tearing, and extensive edema both around the tendon and in the bone. And so this is amenable to therapy that we can offer. Um, here I've flipped over the MRI scan to be the same orientation as the ultrasound here. So this is the um, ischial tuberosity and the hamstring tendons in a transverse sonographic image scrolling up and down. And, you know, I find that the ultrasound is pretty difficult to reproduce the same degree of accuracy in terms of diagnosing the, the tendinopathy. Maybe you'll see some, some of the edema around the tendons. Um, the last scrolling image here is the um, injection and fenestration of the tendons with PRP. And so you can see a little echogenic needle coming in here and it gets down to abrade the bone. So um, kind of fenestrating and doing like percutaneous tenotomy, if you will, and trying to treat the uh, tendon that way. We described our experience in this many years ago using corticosteroids as a fairly recent article uh, from Harvard using PRP. And, you know, it's not perfect. It, it works in many patients, but, um, you know, probably more like 60% of the cases it will be beneficial. Higher grade injury here of a proximal rectus femoris avulsion in a, a professional football player where there's a gap between the tendon and the uh, bony origin here. And um, typically these are still often treated non-surgically, um, maybe sort of surprisingly. Um, in this patient, you can see a hematoma between the ends of the tendon here and the proximal part. And going in and draining that with ultrasound is a very safe thing to do. And you can see that it actually reopposes the tendon ends here, or a stump of tendon, another stump of tendon. And we think that that process of getting rid of the hematoma can actually potentially and hopefully uh, you know, promote healing response. An injury like this one, which is a complete rupture of the Achilles tendon with a gap of probably two or three centimeters, we may not have much to offer. Um, you know, the Achilles injuries are, um, uh, treatment can, can vary between conservative and surgical in this patient, it was enough of a gap that they went on to surgery, so we didn't have much of a, a role to play in imaging. I suppose one could try to drain a hematoma. Um, they often will use PRP as a supplementary agent after the, after the uh, surgical repair. Moving down to the myotendinous junction, this is a very common site of injury where acute myotendinous strain injuries are extremely common that may or may not have a hematoma associated with it. There's also chronic strain injuries that can, uh, can be a source of uh, ongoing pain for patients. And one can treat those with uh, platelet-rich plasma or drainage of the hematoma. Um, I used to use actually a lot of uh, short-acting cor corticosteroids for these early on in my 
career using dexamethasone, and that's been described in hamstring injuries because a lot of these injuries actually create a pretty substantial inflammatory reaction for patients and can be quite painful, and the steroids kind of settle that down. I think over time, I've realized that that's it's really not probably a great idea, and it puts patients at some risk of infection. Um, fortunately, I never had a, a complication from those injections. Here's a more, um, a more recent case where we use platelet-rich plasma, and so here's an axial through the thigh of an initial fairly low-grade injury of the biceps femoris. Patient went back to play um, games that week and had recurrent pain and more of an injury and has more of a collection here with somewhat higher grade, probably an MRI grade two type of an injury here with partial tearing of the tendon and hematoma. So the sagittal MRI shows that collection. And then one thing that's really nice to do if you're looking at the ultrasound is, um, is to look and see if these things are compressible. So um, this hypoechoic or anechoic collection is nicely compressible. So that's really good predictor that it's indeed going to be drainable. Um, down in the middle here, I show some of the hyperemia that can be associated with these injuries in the subacute phase going along with some inflammatory reaction. And so drain the hematoma and then inject platelet-rich plasma around the injury. Um, hopefully that was a, is a benefit to the patient. There's the seroma that came out. One can actually raise the question, you know, we're taking out the patient's blood and replacing it with patient's sort of blood product. Is that really an incremental benefit or not? And we can, we can talk about pros and cons in the, in the discussion if you want. Um, here's a nice example of a, of a hamstring strain injury in the, um, in the semimembranosis. And as I scroll up and down, you can see um, proximally a little bit of edema and then going down lower, there's disruption of the tendon within the muscle belly here and perimuscular edema. There's probably a little hematoma right there. Not a large hematoma, but um, you can see that the, the injury is centered at the myotendinous junction. And that's an important point um, because that's probably the weakest link in this myotendinous unit. So on the sagittal, you can see some muscle fibers coming up to tendon here that's not completely disrupted, but, but uh, injured at that level here. So the myotendinous unit and that real connection is really where to target these uh, injections. So here on the um, MRI fluid around the tendon, Here's the tendon on ultrasound and long image and a little bit of hematoma, uh, edema, at least along that tendon. So that's the place to go in and either try to drain that or certainly is the place to go and try to inject. And we use some um, anesthetic uh, sometimes to try to get things to spread out a little bit further back. That was when we were using more corticosteroid. Um, if it's a long injury, you may need to do an injection over a long um, distance or a couple of different sites. Um, here's a lower grade strain in the biceps femoris, and you can see the feathery edema along the muscle here. And I point out the sciatic nerve here because in this patient, even though it's a low grade injury, there is some edema that gets near the sciatic nerve, and that could be um, pertinent clinically. There's a fairly recent article that came out of uh, Thomas Jefferson that was a nice example of uh, work trying to prove uh, whether or not platelet rich plasma and aspiration is beneficial for patients. And Bottom line was in this study, they had around 50 patients and they found that there was a decreased return to play time around 24 days compared to 32 days in the treatment group versus the people that were treated conservatively. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting was they pointed out that uh, injuries near the sciatic nerve um, were important and hematoma might press on the nerve or might cause some irritation of the nerve. So the thinking was, that getting rid of that with an aspiration could be could be beneficial. Uh, I, I don't know for sure if that's the case, but um, but that's what they were describing. Um, one thing about this paper is uh, that there's a combined at both aspiration and use of platelet-rich plasma, so it's kind of difficult to separate out the therapeutic effect of those two different uh, treatments. Um, another nice case that I like here, it's a, it's a calf injury, and here's a coronal image of the calf, and the green reference line shows where the axial is. And as I go lower, what you'll notice is this aponeurosis of the uh, gastrocnemius tendon uh, adjacent to the muscle. There's definitely some fluid deep to it here. Um, as you go to the next cut or a few cuts down, that tendon disappears. So on the coronal, it's tendon, 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 and then gap. So one thing you, you may get clinically is that if patients have an acute injury and you get a chance to talk to them, you say, did you feel a pop? And patients that come in and say, I felt a pop, doc, 
uh, they don't want to say doc, but they may, um, is typically to me that means they've had some kind of an actual tendon tear because that seems like a more uh, high grade injury. So this guy definitely had felt a pop. And um, <clears throat> what I want to show on the ultrasound here is that you can see the same thing. I'm going to move this, this bar. Um, <clears throat> Here's a transverse ultrasound of that patient's calf, and here we are more proximal. And so here's the gastroc and the soleus deep. So here's the tendon of the gastroc here. Here's that uh, seroma hematoma. As we go lower down, you see the tendon, 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 and, and then further down, and then all of a sudden that tendon is gone. So that's the ultrasound equivalent of this uh, you know, injury um, being depicted. It's just difficult on ultrasound to grade these things, but uh, that's one thing to look for is like when the tendon disappears. So this again was treated with um, percutaneous aspiration of this hematoma in between the muscle groups and injection of PRP, and then the patient goes back to play. So, you know, the question comes up, is PRP really effective or not? And I think the bottom line is we don't really know for sure. This is a nice uh, review article from uh, from Italy, where they looked at 22 studies. And basically, if you look at the, the middle line here, it says three out of the five studies showed no benefit for acute muscle injury. About half the studies showed some benefit for tendon and ligament injuries. So, you know, not 100% by any means. And the problem with all these studies is that it's extremely challenging to do really high quality, um, controlled, uh, randomized and certainly blinded trials to really do a rigorous uh, scientific analysis of whether the uh, the procedure works or not. So there's a, a, the literature is is really kind of a mess in this. Last thing I want to talk about for a minute is muscle belly injuries, and this is kind of where you can have big hematomas or contusions and things like that, um, where we play a role by being able to drain uh, collections, for example. So here's a patient with a quadriceps contusion, like a big kind of direct blow injury where he's got a lot of fluid between the rectus and the, the uh, um, vastus muscles here. And again, nicely compressible on the ultrasound. So you can be quite confident that if you put a needle in that, that will be drainable. And so in this athlete, we were able to drain like 100 cc's of blood out one day. And then he came back two days later, and we got an additional 90 cc's out. Um, here's a big hematoma in the arm in a cornerback. It's a big echogenic collection in the region of the brachialis muscle along the distal humerus, kind of a little bit of a less typical injury, but a, you know, a direct blow in a football player that went on and must have hemorrhaged into the uh, muscle. Um, you know, pretty homogeneous. Um, on ultrasound, we could put a needle in there and then see a layering level and some, some comp complexity to it. Um, but despite appearing somewhat complex, we were able to drain that down and uh, get pretty good, fairly complete drainage of around 70 cc's of blood. <clears throat> now, some things are not gonna be drainable, and this has always been a little bit of a, a controversy or hard to know when things are drainable and when they're not, because hematomas will go through some sort of nat natural evolution. And so here's a coronal image on a, another football player who got, got a direct blow to the thigh and, um, a tiny aside here is that in the in the National Football League, players were not actually required to wear thigh pads and probably around till probably around maybe 10 or 12 years ago. So players could get a direct blow to the thigh musculature um, with a helmet or otherwise and get these types of deep contusions, hematomas adjacent to the bone. This one was right adjacent to the femur. There's a little bit of compressibility to it, and they really were wanting us to be aggressive about trying to drain it. So we actually tried four days in a row. Um, and or, uh, over a course of several days, we really didn't get much out, zero, five, three, and then finally 30 cc's. One of the reasons to perhaps try to, uh, to approach these types of lesions is to try to prevent or decrease the size of uh, myositis ossificans that can occur. <clears throat> so I won't go into the details about it, but we described our experience over many years, about 18 years in um, football athletes, American football athletes talking about hematomas and hematomas uh, which re with related strain injuries or just strain injuries and the types of procedures that we did and our experience with that. Um, bottom line is we, you know, we hope that they're effective. It's hard to know because there's no real controls, uh, but we didn't have any complications with those things. Um, kind of wrapping up here is that, you know, the hematoma question that I mentioned is, um, is hard to know what to do. Um, in terms of the age of the hematoma or what the complexity looks like on ultrasound. And certainly that 
that deep quadriceps hematoma that I showed, it didn't look that promising really for drainage, right? Because it looked kind of complex. Um, but there was a study out of HSS um, recently too, where Ted Miller and, and folks looked at hematomas over a nine-year period, the retrospective study. And they actually showed that there wasn't that much of a correlation between the age of the hematoma and how easy it was to aspirate. So if it was like a day old or a week old or two weeks old, you know, that it was still worth a try. Um, and in addition, maybe equally importantly, 80% of the ones that look complex or heterogeneous or echogenic on ultrasound, they were still able to be aspirated to either moderate or complete decompression. So there is, I think there is a role for giving it an attempt if the patient's willing, and it looks like it's, um, you know, maybe somewhat compressible on ultrasound even though they, these, can, these things can definitely be kind of multi, multi-loculated, if you will, because of uh, clot and fibrin and all that stuff. Using some sort of lavage with saline, or sometimes I'll use some local anesthetic, can be helpful. Um, people bring up the question, would you use something like a, um, a thrombolytic agent to break up clots? And I've never had the nerve to do that. Uh, I think it could be quite a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. So I showed a bunch of cases of myotendinous type injuries, and uh, these are common. MRI is definitely the best way to image them if you have that possibility. Um, ultrasound can detect the high-grade ones and is obviously a great uh, tool to use for image guidance. Um, whether or not you do therapy will depend on the location, injury, what type of injury it is, and, and uh, patient factors are very, very important. I think you see most of the ones that I showed are, are high-level athletes, and they're obviously they're, they're getting paid to, uh, to perform and be uh, on, on the field or in practice. So it's a little bit different than uh, kind of the weekend warrior type thing. And the uh, eff efficacy of these things is not really well established, but um, in, in many situations, they're, they're going to be very safe and might, might or might not return the hasten, hasten the return to play. So thank you so much for your time and attention and um, happy to answer any questions at the end here. Hi, everybody. I now have the honor of introducing Corey Ho. Following his medical training in New York City at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, he completed his radiology residency training at Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital and uh, then did his musculoskeletal radiology fellowship training at Stony Brook University in New York. He moved on to work at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and currently holds the position of assistant professor in the musculoskeletal imaging and intervention section there. His diagnostic practice includes all breadth of MSK imaging and uh, includes imaging of professional athletes. Their interventional practice is highlighted by pain management and interventional oncology. Okay, take it away. Thank you, Hillary, for that wonderful introduction. It's an honor to kind of show you all uh, in the society and OCAD uh, some of the special techniques that we use here in Colorado. So we'll just talk about the case. It's not really, you know, things that we don't see. It's just the technique that we use is interesting. And we'll talk about why it was, you know, meant to be, why we came up with that technique. And then we'll go over the technique a little bit and a little bit of troubleshooting if, if you guys are interested in doing it yourself. So we had a 58 year old woman you know, who presented to us with six out of 10 thoracic pain in her back. It worsens with activities and it's located at the top of her surgical construct. She had a recent revision of spinal uh, surgery, T10 to the pelvis, uh, roughly about three weeks before. Her past surgical history was relevant for L1, L5 fusion in 2011, revised for the ileum in 2016. And her other relevant history is that she is osteopenic with T-score of negative 2.1. So we have sagittal and coronal CT images of the thoracic spine. We see here, this is the T8 vertebral body. There's some sclerosis and end plate deformity along the inferior plate of T8. You can see the scooping of the superior plate of T9. This, this level is instrumented. And the corresponding coronal images show that loss of the superior end plate right up to the, to the screws at T9. So we got some more zoomed up images of the same CT. You can see that the right pedicle screw is a little bit shorter than the left. You can see on the sagittal zoomed in images, 
that the end plates are really scooped and they're really close to the to the end plate as well. And then the coronal shows how close and how much loss there is along that height along the superior end plate of T9. So there's no in imaging in between, but I pulled up her intraoperative images here, and you can see that the the screw has slightly the right screw has moved a little bit of location, and you can see that you know while the screw was was put high before, there's a lot more height loss along that superior plate of T9 on both sides, and then you can see on the coronal images that indeed there is significant height loss as compared to prior study. So the referral came in for her uh, requesting for augmentation of the T8 and T9 vertebral bodies. So you can see here we accepted the case and. Intraoperative images or intraprocedural images, you see AP fluoro or sorry PA fluoro, and the and the well yes just 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 the PA views here, and you see that we went through the the patient's left pedicle here because patient's son is prone, and we targeted that right screw because we still that right screw was a little bit pulled back further, right? So we went down there right, and we went and did an intra well transpedicular transdiscal basic uh, augmentation or kyphoplasty, if you will. So you can see here on the sagittal images, we took a very steep angle to come down through that fractured T8 vertebral body to get into that T9 vertebral body in order to treat it. So we come on a steep angle and we dropped a curved deal through the disc space into the vertebral body below. Once we get down there, we fill that up with cement. So this case filled up very nicely with cement. You can see Patient does have some loosening around the screw because it a little bit did not accept any cement readily. Then on the way out, we drop a little bit of cement. We can explain that a little bit later into the disc. And then I make sure I fill up that vertebral body above completely as well. So these are the post images. And when you're following the case, she did not require additional surgery. So, and the cement and everything looks like it's it's holding pretty well. So really, what's the background here? The background is a lot of people have back pain, uh, a lot of, and a lot of surgeons are doing surgery for it, right? There's a big increase in surgery over the last decade. And sometimes when you do surgery, especially when we start doing it younger or even with older patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis, you have to constantly extend that fusion superiorly. The complications you know, of hardware are hardware failure, fracture, and degeneration. So really the main thing that, you know, sitting in on the, on the conferences with our orthospine surgeon, you know, they're always talking about PJK, which is proximal junctional kyphosis or proximal junctional failure. And that's defined as a Cobb angle change of greater than 10 degrees from the preoperative measurement incidence as high as 40% in some of the literature and most commonly due to adjacent level fracture. And you can see here that this space is gone and there's height loss along those two vertebral bodies. So this often requires revision or hardware extension. That's why you get those patients that have their entire spine fused. And this is significantly related to lumbar density. So the solutions to this are when they do the surgery, they could use cannulated pedicle screws to try and reinforce that level. However, it doesn't fix the level immediately above it. Or they could, you know, once it's failed, they can have extension or revision of hardware, or they can ask us to do a conventional vertebral augmentation. But you can see here, this is the image of the instrumental level. Re conventional vertebral augmentation is a little bit problematic because obviously our access points are blocked by the, the pedicle screws. So how did this come to be? So our surgeons were kind of struggling with the extra cases that they had to do. And then patients didn't want to have surgery and patients were older and some of the patients were not cleared for surgery. So they came to us and we kind of came up with the, we did come up with this technique to try to treat this proximal junctional kyphosis or failure. So we utilized a technology that was at hand so the idea was to gain access through the vertebral body that was not blocked to so the proximal level, go through it, use the curved needle to go through the disc space and access that injured vertebral body with the, with the loosened screw sometimes or the fracture. And the idea was to fill both the cement to, to create a solid foundation or kind of reinforce it to prevent any further kyphosis. And they also kind of, they assumed that the disc wasn't working very well either. And they also wanted to kind of create as much stability as possible. So that's why they wanted us to put some cement into the disc too, to, to kind of give it as much or any little extra stability as possible. Cause there's so much stress 
when you put the hardware in, right? The, the, the stress bypasses all the hardware levels. And then once the hardware disappears, there's an extreme amount of stress at that level. So we'll go over the technique here. So you can see here that we take a pretty steep approach. So normally, so our scan entry site is actually the vertebral body above. Normally when you, when you do these cases, you're doing them basically parallel to the, to the body of your axis, but you gotta go super, really steep here and which is targeting the middle to posterior third, obviously safely to not in, to violate the inferior pedicle wall to deploy that curved needle down into the uh, other level. So here, these are the, uh, the frontal views here. And since we have some Brasileros in the, in the audience, this is what I tell my fellows is that these screws are your goalposts, right? And you wanna score a goal every time. So you gotta put the needle or the ball between the goalposts. If you hit the goalposts, the ball's gonna bounce out or your needle's gonna bounce out. And you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be able to score. So targeting is very important as you're, as you're coming down in, into this. And obviously, the surgeons place their screws very differently at times. Sometimes they're really medialized, sometimes they're really lateralized. So the medialized ones, you have to really be careful. So as we've done more and more of these cases over the years, I've discovered that if you don't fill the top level up, they end up fracturing because it's a tremendous amount of stress from that proximal junctional level. So therefore I, I make it a point to fill up that top level. So we make tracks to try and, and our best to, to try and fill up that top level as well as much as we can. So my section chief, he is kind of like an entomologist. He likes to you know, study bugs. And he was looking at our cases and he was like, this looks like an assassin bug. So we've named this the assassin bug. And you know, the curved needle is kind of like that proboscis coming out from the assassin bug that it uses to kill its prey. So if you're interested in doing this, uh, things that you can do, you can use the beveled needle to kind of really steer yourself. You can use a curette to kind of make some more space. You can use a drill tip if you run into some hard bone or older bone. And you could use powered access, but really the main thing is, is planning. Uh, Cause you can see here that we saw that one screw was shorter than the other, just like in our other case. So that's the side that we targeted. And this is just us using the, the drill tip to get through a really dense bone. And with that, thank you and obrigado for your attention and letting us share one of the special techniques that we do here in Colorado. Thank you, Kari. Obrigada. <laughs> So there are a few questions here in the chat box. Some of them were are they uh, the the speakers have already answered. Um, so let me see here. To Paulo, do you think it's possible to differentiate shivanoma from neurofibroma with uh, MRI? I usually don't. I usually just call them nerve sheet tumors, but there are some signs that, that you can use, but I usually don't. Thank you. Um, not all of the, from Miguel Vega, I think it's for Gunner. Uh, not all of the bone cryoablations required uh, cementoplasty. Is there a cutoff size or bone location to include the stabilization? Gunner? Yeah, I honestly did. Um, it's a, it's a, they, if they do the cryo at the lat lateral superior part of the neck, it's a tensile group of trabeculus. So they're afraid of that that part will be weakened. So okay. therefore, they, therefore, they put the, the, the cement there. Um, there's also a question for Chris. Do you place the drainage tube or you just drain hematomas with only aspiration? Um, do you suggest and any indication and contrary indication need for surgical repair? Um, thank you. I So personally, we don't in our MSK division use any drainage catheters for hematomas that there's obviously some potential risk of infection, which could be um, a, de a definite risk. Um, uh, one of our, our, our IR colleagues have done drain a couple drainages and where there was a pectoralis tear in a football player that they used a drainage catheter in for a few days. So it's, it's certainly possible. On the um, indications for surgery, I think, you know, we, uh, 
I, th I guess I'm thinking of something like a proximal hamstring tear, and we use criteria that the orthopedic surgeons, you know, go by about how many yeah. tendons are torn and degree of retraction to try to help triage things into a more of a surgical category or not. So it depends on the site of injury, I think. Thank you. And there is one last question. What is the best image tool to evaluate bone metastasis response treated with immunotherapy, PET CT or MI uh, with DWI and Dixon? Thanks from Rio de Janeiro. And go I, don't, I, I don't think that uh, those data exist yet. And uh, there are also coming new uh, immunotherapies every half a year or so, many times a year now. So we have to learn about this. So the different uh, immunotherapies also have different side effects or reactions in bone and muscles and, and joints. So you might have a uptake in, in the joint after the immunotherapy or in the muscle or in bone. So we have to learn this. So I can't tell the answer, which method is the best. Thank you. Um, there's one last question. Uh, I think it's for Curry. Do you have an objection of doing cyphoplasty with low dose CT than fluoroscopy as the latter has harm to the one performing as he, she is expected to be exposed multiple times? It's yeah. yeah, it's a good question. So we do cryoplasty under CT and under fluoro. So there's some things to think about, right? So there are, you know, CT can be really low these days and, you know, there are, you know, we do cryos under CT as well. And those are pretty low dose. But, you know, a lot of the patients that we do are older patients, osteoporotic patients. So the radiation is not, you know, that, you know, the top of my concern for that. So the, the difference between doing it under floor or under CT that I find is that you really can't see your cement very well if you do it under CT. So when your cement kind of squirts out, because you can only see so, so much on that CT per slice. And, you know, you have a hard time of tracking that cement safely, because obviously when I see something go backwards, that's when I kind of bail and, and move, move, move elsewhere. The only thing is, you know, especially for this, for that technique, it's extremely difficult to, to have such a steep angle, vertical angle under the, the CT because our gantry is only twists like about 10 or 15 degrees. Thank you all for tuning in today. We look forward to the next session, which will be held on May 19th with focus on sports imaging. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you all.